very pleased to have three uh, presenters join us today. This is the second in our series and we do have um, a strong focus today on mobility and human rights and regular pathways. So while we're, we're still getting people joining, I can see as the numbers are going up, um, please uh, allow me to do a short introduction to really situate uh, the webinar series and situate the papers uh, that uh, have been produced as part of this uh, really big picture look at uh, migration and mobility in the context of transformations um, globally. Uh, firstly, very, very many thanks for our panellists who I will introduce in a moment, uh, who will be taking us through their very short uh, think pieces on migration and mobility. And also to many people who are joining us from all over, all over the world. Uh, as you may recall, in 2017, IOM set up the Migration Research Leaders Syndicate uh, to inform the Global Compact on safe, orderly and regular migration and the uh, intergovernmental negotiations and the finalisation of the compact itself. In, in many ways, actually, our high-level advisors uh, supersede the syndicate and pick up where the syndicate sort of like left off, given that it was a specific project around the Global Compact. So we're very pleased to be able to collaborate and work with, again, some of the big uh, thinkers on migration and displacement from, from all over the world, from different parts and different corners of the world. Before we start the substantive sort of discussions and hear from our presenters, um, just really it's worthwhile recalling um, some of the very long-term focus that IOM has had on migration research. And, and Susan Martin, of course, uh, who will be presenting later, knows this full well, having uh, really traversed the history of um, global governance of migration and knows that IOM established in 1951 as an operational agency you know, in the aftermath of, of World War II has also had a strong focus on migration research uh, and analysis. And while we might be considered to be an operational agency historically and have a very strong presence around the globe in delivering services, to uh, beneficiaries, to migrants, to especially to vulnerable migrants, but also to member states and working with all sorts of collaborators uh, in the field. We also have a very, very strong uh, history in regards to migration research and analysis. Um, IOM in its own right uh, publishes more than 100 publications on migration research uh, every year through our online bookstore. And we also work very closely with research partners in terms of delivering research projects throughout uh, the world and especially in some of the more, should I say, neglected geographies. Uh, we're also very pleased and have been working for a long time with the academic community, of course. And as you may know, uh, IOM helped establish the scientific journal that is currently published by uh, Wiley and co, uh, international migration. Um, and we have been supporting uh, international migration since 1961 through very kind of um, uh, modest financial support and we um, support the editors and the editorial board of international migration. We also work, of course, with the scientific community and with member states in producing migration research and analysis, of course, uh, the, the premier kind of um, uh, contribution certainly from the research team is in regards to the biennial flagship report, the World Migration Report. So in terms of that very short introduction, in terms of situating this particular webinar and this particular webinar um, series, let us uh, recall uh, IOM's great strength in the field, but also its long-term uh, interest and keen support of um, scientific and applied migration research and analysis from all over the world. Now, in terms of today's uh, session, we will have our first um, presenter, uh, Vincent Chetal, take us through human rights, followed by Susan Martin, looking at mobility systems, and then uh, Louisa Feline Ferrer, who will actually take us through regular pathways and some of the responses that have uh, occurred and some of the good practices that have occurred so, so, so far. We will then open up to a Q&A for all of the presenters. So please feel free to put your questions um, in the Q&A function. They will be 
uh, transfers to me and we'll be able to have a rich discussion um, with various people connected all over the world, uh, as the case may be these days in this virtual environment. And we have set aside ample time, so please do feel free to send through your questions at any time. And when we get to the Q&A, we'll be able to direct those to um, the presenters. Okay, so if you can allow me now just to very quickly introduce all three of our speakers. Uh, Vincent Chetal is joining us um, from Geneva. He is the director of the Global Migration Centre, a professor of international law at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies, and is also the president of the board of the Geneva Academy of International Human Law, uh, Humanitarian Law and Human Rights. He's an internationally recognised expert with 20 years of experience in law and policy of migration and displacement. He regularly serves as an expert advisor to governments, to NGOs, to international organisations, including ourselves, and has led over 20 projects and extensively published on migration and displacement. We also have joining us uh, Susan Martin. Susan held the Donald G. Hertzberg Chair in International Migration and founded and led the Institute for the Study of International Migration at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Previously, Professor Martin served as the Executive Director of the U.S. Commission on Immigration Reform, established by legislation to advise Congress and the President on U.S. immigration and refugee policy. Uh, Professor Martin advises academic and policy boards all around the world on various aspects of international migration and displacement and is extremely widely published also on migration and displacement. So welcome to Susan too. Lastly, our third speaker will be Louisa Feline Ferrer, an assistant professor of political science at the Pacific University in Peru, joining us from Peru. Her research focuses on migration and refugee policy and law in Latin America, regional South-South migration, and of course, more recently, and most unfortunately, the Venezuelan displacement crisis. Uh, Professor Ferreira has published widely in academic policy and media outlets and has been interviewed on Venezuelan immigration and displacement across international media. She has provided advice to various international institutions and organizations such as, I'll just name a few of them, Amnesty International, ICRC, IOM, of course, UNHCR, and the World Bank. So thank you again to our esteemed panelists. Um, looking forward to the presentations, and I will first hand over to uh, Professor Chetal. Bonson, over to you. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, this is always a pleasure to be involved in uh, 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 webinars and other events organized by yourself and uh, IOM in general. Uh, uh, today, and I'm also very pleased to, to be uh, virtually here uh, with great uh, experts such as uh, Susan Martin and Kevin Freyer. This is uh, a real pleasure. Uh, I will um, discuss today uh, about uh, uh, the, the impact of COVID-19 on human rights of migrants and the overall framework, uh, mainly normative framework. Uh, I will uh, please give me to, oh, sorry. Yes. So uh, I will uh, uh, present. Uh, uh, I will discuss here uh, the COVID-19 and human rights of migrants. The, the, the impact of COVID-19 on the protection of migrants provides a telling example of both challenges and opportunities. Uh, in terms of the so challenges, are, are quite obvious. Uh, the moral panic triggered by COVID-19 has highlighted the risk of creating a migration crisis within the health crisis, simply because COVID-19 produces new forms of vulnerabilities and exacerbates existing ones. And uh, the impact of COVID-19 upon vulnerabilities of migrants is well documented. Uh, I will not uh, develop this, but of course, the most uh, obvious uh, uh, instances include Obstacle in accessing healthcare, denial of protection because of border closure, rise of racism, stigma, and, and so on. But uh, clearly, uh, uh, neglecting the, the human rights 
of migrants uh, can be uh, uh, arguably counterproductive or even dangerous in addressing the health uh, crisis for three uh, basic reasons. First of all, denying protection to migrants increases the risk of contagion within the whole population. Second, it encourages irregular migration without any health uh, control and follow-up. And third, a large percentage of migrants are working in sectors uh, essential to address the uh, pandemic. So against this background, and uh, uh, to go beyond the, the typical challenges inherent to COVID-19, the current uh, pandemic may be also an opportunity to devise and evidence-based policies grounded on uh, rule of law. Uh, following this extent, my main argument is the following one. Public health and human rights are not mutually exclusive. They can and they must be reconciled within a sound and evidence-based approach. Uh, the human rights of migrants as grounded on international law provide a flexible uh, toolbox to address their needs of protection while facing the current uh, uh, emergency. And in fact, as I will develop uh, uh, in a few seconds, addressing the pandemic may require more or less rights depending on the relevant uh, legal norms and factual uh, circumstances. And in fact, human rights law is quite well equipped to face public emergencies with due regard to state sovereignty and fundamental rights of individuals. Um, there are basically, as mentioned in this uh, slide, three layers of legal norms in case of uh, emergency, such as the one of COVID-19. The first layer uh, are co-content of human rights in terms of emergency, second, derogation mechanism, and third, restriction to human rights. So let's start with the very first normative level the core content of uh, uh, human rights in terms of emergency. Because some basic principles and basic rights are given in any circumstances, including in times of armed conflict, emergency, and pandemics. Freedom from torture is an obvious example of prohibition of forced labor, uh, are typical instances of fundamental rights available to everyone in uh, uh, any circumstances. In the context of migration, I identify some core rights at the border. Principle of non-refoulement, prohibition of collective expulsion, uh, principle of non-discrimination, the best interest of the child, and the prohibition of racism are, are a crucial uh, uh, rights in terms of emergency. And uh, uh, these rights remain plainly applicable in the sense that these core rights are minimum standards of humanity. They are not negotiable, they prevail over any consideration, and they share three uh, main characteristics I identify uh, in the slide. First, they are legally binding for all states, under customary international law and reinforced by a broad range of uh, widely ratified conventions. Second, these core rights at the border are absolute. They cannot suffer from any exception or derogation in uh, any circumstances including in terms of pandemic, and third, they apply to all migrants, regardless of their documentation, uh, status, and registration. So this is the very first starting point to identify uh, the, the, the first normative level uh, governing the response uh, in, in, uh, 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 in terms of United. The second level, the second uh, normative level uh, 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 is uh, based on the derogation mechanism provided by some, but not all, human rights conventions. So uh, all these levels accumulate. So first, the core content of human rights in terms of emergency are plainly applicable in any circumstances. And then this is supplemented by the second layer based on the derogation mechanism, which means that in some exceptional circumstances, states may derogate from uh, 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 their conventional duties, but provided that six cumulative conditions are fulfilled. I identify uh, six, uh, uh, the six conditions uh, 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 to, uh, that are required by the relevant uh, treaties. So uh, 
Uh, typically, uh, the use of derogation requires a public emergency, so in this case, a threat of a widespread contagion within the whole population. Second, this public emergency must be officially proclaimed and notified with the, the, the reasons. Necessity, derogation must be strictly required by the situation in order to protect public health. Fourth condition, uh, the, deroga the derogation must be proportionate to the objective of protecting public health. Five conditions, some human rights cannot be subjected to any derogation in line with the uh, co-content of uh, human rights uh, 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 I mentioned. And finally, compliance with other international obligations, which means that derogations must be consistent with other legal duties under customary law, but also under uh, treaty law, because, and here, uh, this is an important uh, element in the broader picture, because contrary to the common belief, the vast majority of conventions governing human rights and migration do not provide a derogation mechanism. So they are still uh, plainly applicable in the context of COVID-19. I put here a list of the most relevant UN conventions without any specific derogation mechanism. So uh, the Convention on Social and Cultural Rights Against Discrimination, the different uh, specialized instruments on labor migration, but also on smuggling of migrants and so on. So all these conventions remain uh, 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 plainly applicable, but obviously this does not mean that states shall implement them as if uh, the pandemic never happened. Uh, on the contrary, states, are bound by these treaties, these treaties to protect uh, 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 the right to, uh, to, to protect life and health within their uh, uh, relevant scope. So the, uh, to, to, to mention the very first example, the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Uh, all economic and social rights may be subjected to lawful restriction in order to, public, uh, in order to protect public health. However, a core content of subsistence rights is guaranteed in any circumstances to all individuals. So as a result of the plain applicability of the covenant, equal access to health care for all migrants remains utterly uh, remains binding and uh, is in fact more needed than ever in order to avoid the spread of the contagion. So, uh, 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 even from the angle of derogation mechanism, uh, there is a room for uh, implementing other uh, conventions that are extremely important and relevant, both to protect uh, for, for the, the two uh, awful purposes of protecting health and migrants. The third level, uh, uh, the third normative level, it concerns uh, uh, restrictions to human rights. Uh, <clears throat> addressing the public health uh, emergency may require more or less rights uh, uh, depending on the relevant norms. So, uh, in most cases, states are able to attain the public health objective by invoking the possibility to restrict certain rights. In fact, the vast majority of human rights are not absolute. They may be subjected to look for restriction. I identify here uh, some of the most basic relative rights associated with migration, right to live in a country, family reunification, prohibition of arbitrary detention, uh, freedom of movement within the territory uh, of a state. So, but here again, even if uh, these rights can be uh, lawfully restricted, uh, there are some conditions to be fulfilled. I mean, this is uh, an emergency does not mean the end of the rule of law, on the contrary. Rule of law is needed than ever in situations of emergencies like the COVID-19. And to be full, a restriction to a human rights must, be, must meet four cumulative conditions that uh, I listed here in this slide. Legality, so legal basis. So restriction is provided by legal basis. Second, necessity. So restriction is necessary for the protection of public health, not for other uh, uh, purposes. Third, proportionality. 
The restriction is proportionate to the protection of public health and constitutes the least intrusive means to achieve these uh, objectives. And fourth, compatibility with other rights. Restriction is consistent with other rights, including non-discrimination. So against this background, restriction of human rights to protect public health must be specifically aimed at preventing disease or injury or providing care for the sick and injury. So as a result of this this normative framework is useful uh, as a toolbox for action because on the one hand, mitigating the spread of the contagion may justify restriction to freedom of movement uh, within the territory of states. But in other circumstances, and in fact in most uh, uh, circumstances, restrictions are simply unable to protect public acts. These objectives may be, ach- may be achieved in implementing human rights as a whole. So uh, a typical example, the prohibition of arbitrary uh, detention, uh, uh, the duty to provide alternatives to detention is uh, further required to avoid the contagion in immigration detention centers. So clearly, German rights work provides a toolbox in order to uh, address the pandemic and uh, while ensuring the protection of migrants. Of course, uh, uh, the future spread of contagion and in impact on mobility are uh, hardly predictable. Uh, It remains, however, that COVID-19 may be an opportunity to restate and reinforce a sound, coherent, and human rights-based approach to migration policies alongside uh, public health objectives. Uh, And uh, the the, the three layers, the three uh, normative levels I identify should be the starting point for any state action in these uh, area simply because states <clears throat> are legally committed by these norms and they are legally committed to protect public health and human rights in managing their borders. But of course, integrating health and protection consideration at the borders requires much more than implementing international law. COVID 19 is likely to become the new normal. So, integrating health and protection consideration is an opportunity to rethink immigration policies through innovative solutions in due respect with human rights. Uh, Taking seriously uh, public health uh, means, uh, at the end, more than less rights for migrants, simply because protecting persons of the move is protecting everyone. And that is why many stakeholders have also adopted non-binding recommendations to increase the protection of migrants with the view of mitigating the impact of COVID-19. Uh, uh, and uh, I put here a, li- uh, a very short uh, uh, list of uh, some uh, non-binding recommendations, so going beyond uh, binding duties of states. The UN Network on Migration, for instance, uh, has uh, uh, recommended uh, suspension of forced return of migrants and, ins- and full access to basic services uh, for all migrants and without regard to the documentation. So there, there is a need for adaptation. IOM, uh, among, or again, other instances, uh, has also identified several non-binding recommendations with the view of merging immigration and health imperatives. You can find uh, the, uh, a non-exhaustive list uh, of these uh, recommendations. So to, to conclude, of course, these non-Biden recommendations are not exhaustive, and, and uh, there are many other innovative solutions, uh, uh, mobility cor- uh, corridors, immunity passports, uh, and so on. International human rights law is the starting point, but this is not the final point, uh, in the sense that states must adapt their uh, migration policy with due regard to uh, uh, both the protection uh, of migrants and public health, and the two can be reconciled uh, uh, in uh, legal and policy terms. And, uh, and this is very, uh, extremely important because uh, addressing the many the challenges of COVID-19 will require a rethink of migration policies so that they can be responsive to the changing evolution of the pandemic while maintaining consistent adherence to human rights. And uh, to finish, uh, uh, because it well summarized 
the key, uh, the need for or protection for migrants uh, 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 and for the benefit of all, I, I will finish by uh, a, 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 quote, a quotation from the UN Secretary General. The UN Secretary General underlined, and I quote, no one is safe until everyone is safe. This crisis is an opportunity to reimagine human mobility for the benefit of all while advancing our central commitment of the 2030 Agenda to leave no one behind. And I prefer to finish on this rather optimist message uh, in uh, a context that is not so optimist, uh, generally speaking. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you so much, Vincent, uh, taking us through the, the key issues very succinctly and clearly and a, and a fantastic. I've got lots of questions, of course, uh, popping up and I can tell that others are thinking about these things through. Um, I would certainly point to, you know, your very, very sort of clear message to all of us in regards to using the toolbox fact in terms of a human rights and migrant-centric sort of approach. And, and that quote from the Secretary General. And I think you're absolutely right in terms of COVID-19 may be seen as one pandemic, but this is our future as we know the human uh, kind of natural world environmental aspects and the increase in uh, kind of zoonotic uh, coronaviruses is, is certainly on the agenda and has been for some time. As we know, many people have been uh, heralding the big one, so to speak, it's now here, but it but it is going to be more uh, prevalent in our in our futures, um, unfortunately. So now it's a perfect time to turn to uh, Susan Martin to hear about some of the mobility dynamics that will need to be interwoven into, as you said, uh, Vincent, the you know the public health aspects more and more integrated into the future. So I will hand over now to uh, Susan, who will be presenting her paper on, you know, the really big thinking around some of the transfers in regards to mobility systems. I would also point out to, and I'm sure that Susan will do it as well, a big thanks also to her co-author, uh, Jonas Bergman, who worked with her on this um, high-level advice paper. Over to you, Susan. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to this uh, webinar, and I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, sometimes my internet connection is not great uh, where I live, but I think a lot of other people have the same problem. Um, let me uh, share my screen. And uh, continue from here. As uh, Murray said, um, Jonas Bergman and I have been working on a number of different cuts into the issue of um, the effects of pandemics, particularly COVID-19, but more broadly, um, on the trends in both mobility and immobility, trying to understand what happens uh, during pandemics to the ability of people uh, to move as well as their desire to move. Um, and we've been doing research on the history of pandemics um, in order to be able to see what the uh, prevalent patterns have been and what the impacts of those patterns of mobility have been. Um, and looking at also what the public health guidances are over time uh, with regard to this. Um, we start with the fact that there is a two-way relationship between infectious disease and human mobility. Um, they're intrinsically linked. Um, so human mobility obviously affects the spread of infectious disease. Um, so, and, but, and it's not a new phenomenon. Uh, if you go back to um, pandemics in um, the you know, ancient Greece or um, in Rome or during the medieval period, uh, we see a lot of examples where uh, the movements of, um, of people um, as well as the movements um, in trade uh, have allowed infectious diseases to spread well beyond the borders of the countries um, in which they're identified. And very often um, it's been difficult to track back exactly where these diseases began. Um, and that's been true um, of even uh, the 20th and 21st century um, infectious disease. 
But when through this process of human mobility, uh, the disease is spread um, worldwide, then they eventually become known as pandemics, um, as has been the case with COVID-19. Uh, but then we've also been looking at the impact of um, infectious diseases and resulting pandemics on further mobility patterns. Uh, and it's identified that some of the impacts are direct. They are specifically related to the disease. Uh, but many of them are indirect, for example, through the economic impacts that occur as a result of pandemics um, and as a result of the responses to pandemics. Um, and all of us, of course, are familiar with the massive cancellation of flights uh, that occurred um, starting in, in around March and continuing uh, to the present day. So we have been uh, very much um, inspired by the work of Jürgen Carling, um, Hans de Haas, and others um, who have been trying to set out the different forms of mobility um, and looking at both voluntary and involuntary patterns. Um, and then to take that interest in looking at voluntary and involuntary involuntary mobility and immobility and understanding two facets of the problem. Um, one are what are the aspirations of people towards movement, towards migration? Uh, do they want to leave where they are and go to some other place? And then secondly, what are their capacities in order to be able to act on their aspirations? And we see um, in situations where people's aspiration to move is very low and their capabilities are very low, they're sort of acquiescent in deciding that they will be immobile. It's not that they um, want to move, but they also don't have the capabilities even if they wanted to do so. Um, but on the other hand, if the aspirations are very high, and this now the bottom um, right-hand quadrant, if your aspirations are high and your capabilities are high, uh, then we have what we would normally think of as fully voluntary mobility um, because people really want to do it and they have that capability. Um, on the other hand, if their aspirations are low but their capabilities are high, um, it may be that they are um, definitely um, involuntarily immobile. They're staying at home because they want to. They could have moved, but they don't. But they can also be involuntarily um, mobile if the conditions around them are such that they have to get out of harm's way. So it's not because of their decisions, but because of the circumstances um, that they're Facing, and that's really what, how we think about refugee movements, displaced persons. Um, they're, um, they're involuntarily moving elsewhere. Then the final um, quadrant is involuntary immobility. Um, this is where their aspirations are high. They really want to get out, out from where they are, um, but their capabilities are so low that they can't do it. In the context of crises, uh, this, this involves people who are trapped in place. Um, by all estimations, they should get out of where they are, uh, but they can't. Um, and uh, this issue has gotten increased attention um, largely in the context of uh, both conflict, but um, particularly in natural, natural hazards um, in which um, in Hurricane Katrina, for example, you had um, people in nursing homes um, or extremely poor people who just didn't have the ability uh, to get out of harm's way and death rates tended to be much higher in those circumstances. Uh, I think unexpectedly the travel restrictions to combat the spread of COVID-19 um, occurred uh, not not quickly, but within the first couple of months of the 
um, of the pandemic um, and multiplied uh, beyond what has been the case in many previous pandemics. Um, so according to IOM's own data, um, as of June 2020, when some of these started to be relaxed, um, governments had issued about 45,000 travel orders, mostly restricting movements um, either into or within their countries. Um, many of them were comprehensive travel bans, um, and they um, apply to either everyone within the country or um, to anyone trying to get into or out of the country. Um, other bans, and the more, I think more like, um, more, um, often the bans were aimed at specific countries or regions. Um, they emerged when um, the, um, the disease flared in China, for example, initially, um, or and then in other parts of the world, and then travel bans or restrictions were imposed on those particular places. Um, often there were border closures with contiguous countries and, or sometimes all contiguous countries within a particular region. Um, others allowed travel, but they had mandatory quarantines on travelers. Um, so as people came into a new country or into a new part of the um, country they lived in, they would have to quarantine typically for 10 to 14 days. Uh, before they would be able to move more freely around. Uh, there were also restrictions on new visas and renewals. Um, in some cases, that process was made easier, um, particularly for renewals for people, but in other cases, it was made more difficult, particularly if there was a, considered to be a, an immediate threat um, of, the, um, of the transmission of the disease. Um, and then there were also new documentary, uh, documentation requirements. Uh, there were differences in the application of travel restrictions to citizens versus non-citizens. Um, so we ended up with situations in which um, citizens could return home, but non-citizens were not allowed to enter. Um, and so some people who were in a place where the pandemic had already reached, reached crisis proportions could travel, but others could not. Refugees were exempt or asylum seekers were exempt in some cases, but not in others. Um, and that gets to back to um, Vincent's points about the um, international law um, and, uh, and how countries applied it. Um, some applied only to entry um, into the territory um, or to a new location within countries, others to exit as well. Um, and the timing differed in terms of when in the pandemic it was, they were issued, but also importantly when they went into effect, whether it was an immediate um, effect or whether there were several days in which people could potentially relocate if they wanted to. My screen is frozen. Uh, okay, sorry, uh, my screen was frozen for a minute. Um, there were benefits and detriments to travel restrictions. Um, the benefits included, and this is based on uh, research that has been done on multiple pandemics um, in looking what the impact of travel restrictions were. Uh, the benefits were generally a very short delay in the spread of diseases. Um, that could be from a few days to a few weeks. And the restrictions were beneficial if they were used to put normal public health interventions in place meaning screening, testing, quarantine, isolation. Um, but the consensus of the research on past pandemics is that travel bans don't work in the absence of other interventions. Um, they also don't work if they're put in place after the disease has already spread uh, within a particular community. Uh, they don't right or wrong that's already happened. Um, and there are a lot of detriments to 
imposing travel restrictions. Um, it, an additional spread of disease if people are very rushed to return or enter before the ban goes into place. Um, so that, that's why the timing is so critical. Um, and when in the case of COVID, we saw in many parts of the world, particularly um, in the United States, when um, travel bans were put in place, there was a rush of return of citizens, many of whom carried the uh, disease back home before there were screening process in places at, um, at airports and other locations. Um, obvious ne negative in, um, economic impacts, risk to vulnerable populations, particularly asylum seekers, if they uh, then apply to them as well. Um, also a full sense of security, uh, leaders saying, you know, we have a handle on this because we've uh, put in these travel restrictions, but being slow to put other interventions in place during that short period in which it was critical to get them there. And human rights violations in enforcing the travel restrictions. Um, some of the directly related ones were the stay-at-home measures. Um, there, there was a high level of voluntary or acquiescent in mobility related to these orders, with few exceptions. Um, enforcement, there were very few enforcement measures to require compliance, but people did so anyway. Um, and this led, of course, to a disruption in international and domestic travel. Um, exceptions were made um, for essential workers and activities, um, but then we saw some differential and quite bad impact based on income, race, immigration status, gender, um, and a disproportionate number of essential workers in many industries uh, were migrants themselves and were affected by the crisis, not just in terms of the pandemic, but in terms of the type of occupations um, that they, they held. But then the economic drivers of mobility were also pandemic related and extremely um, important in thinking about forms of mobility. Um, there's the contraction, of course, of the economy and the prolonged recession. Um, there's less need for workers, visas weren't issued. Um, high levels of unemployment and few pe fewer people had financial resources needed for mobility. Um, there were remote work opportunities um, along with the stay at home orders um, that further really reduced mobilities and online platforms and tools that allowed exactly what we're doing right now, um, having a webinar conference in effect. Um, that is involving people over, all over the world who are not moving um, in order to get there. We also saw some shifting patterns of internal mobility. And this is from the New Delhi bus terminal where people were attempting to get back home before the travel restrictions um, went into effect. Uh, we've seen some apparent increases in urban to rural movements. I say apparent because there are a few empirical studies uh, yet of this phenomenon. The one from Senegal, though, that was taken, uh, took place in early March to mid-April, um, showed that there was a loss of population in Dakar um, and regional capitals, but an increase in um, like, of net migration into villages um, in more rural areas. Um, this was a result of the phone survey that uh, took place during that period of time. Um, so we saw migrant workers returning. We saw elderly seeking um, safe refuges, uh, people going if they were fortunate enough to do, to do so. And this relates to the economic disparities, but uh, people um, going to second homes in more remote areas. Um, and remote workers could, of course, function from anywhere. Um, and so there was an impetus to take these, make these changes. Um, international migrants also sought to repatriate. Um, many of them had lost their jobs or they had no health insurance. And I'll, I'll talk a bit in a minute about the migrants and countries in crisis phenomenon um, and the guidelines there. Um, often these migrants experienced involuntary mobility 
Um, if they were able to return, there were still just difficulties in reintegration um, back home, particularly given the context of, of uh, the pandemic. Um, and for refugees and IDPs, potential dangers of conflict um, continued or if they were trapped um, in place. Now, I want to talk about two um, frameworks. Um, one is the uh, NICAID framework, but the other is the international health regulations. Uh, these were identified unanimously by you know, you, um, World Health Organization member states in 2005. Um, they are not binding international laws, but they have the effect of being um, universally accepted guidance. Um, and states agree to respect the dignity, human rights, and fundamental freedoms of travel travelers and minimize their discomfort or distress. Um, and that mean, meant including measures at, um, at seaports, airports, ground crossings to limit the spread um, of health risks to other countries, but by the least invasive means possible, um, and preferably by vaccination or other prophylaxis or um, established health measures such as the quarantine, isolation, um, public health observation. And of course, states retain their right to deny entry if the traveler refused to comply. Uh, but the idea was that there wouldn't be um, the massive type of travel restrictions uh, that governments ne nevertheless um, uh, put into place in the context of COVID-19, um, knowing and having already um, adopted regulations um, that were to the contrary. Uh, there also were need for contingency planning, um, and states could adopt additional measures, but they needed to be supported by relevant scientific information and a public health rationale, particularly if they interfered with international travel. Um, like many human rights provisions, however, there were no you know, enforcement mechanisms. Um, and so governments did, for the most part, not, uh, were not compliant. Oops, I'm frozen again on my... Uh, oh, here we go. Um, so, <clears throat> As I mentioned before, it's not just citizens who are affected by pandemics, uh, but there are also migrants who are already in the country that are affected, um, who may be in, um, in need of help from their country of origin, help from the country of destination where they're working, and help from the international community um, in this context. And I think that the guidelines that were developed with the idea of um, conflict and natural hazards are actually very much applicable in the context of pandemic. And I think we need to be doing more work in figuring out at which stages we need to do which actions in order to have better policies related to migration um, in these contexts, both in terms of the preparedness that we know is so important um, for being able to incorporate migra migrants into the, um, into the plans for whether they're public health plans or emergency preparedness, but also to provide in the emergency response um, phase to ensure that migrants are getting the assistance and help that they're needed, uh, but then in the post-crisis stage to support the, their recovery and the recovery of the host um, communities. So something that was developed not fully with pandemics in mind, although it was discussed in the early stages of the um, MICIC um, process, I think um, could be used more extensively in dealing with the issues of migration. Um, and um, once more, frozen in terms of my PowerPoint, but I think this was my last, oh no, I have my recommendations. If I can get there. I'm gonna come out of the sharing 
Sorry about this. Ah, here we go. Let me. Okay, so let me uh, just go through some of the conclusions and recommendations. I won't show the slide because I'm afraid that it'll freeze again. Uh, but states should be cautious in the use of broad travel pans and border closures. Um, they should anticipate the unintended but predictable side events of travel bans. If they're poorly conceived, they can do more harm than good. They should ensure that travel restrictions don't violate the right to seek and, and enjoy asylum or the non full month obligations. They should abide by these international health regulations uh, to make sure that the Policies regarding mobility are based on successful epidemiological and public health practices. Um, states should plan for the effects of pandemic responses on human mobility to address the economic impacts that can prompt harmful patterns of mobility and immobility. Uh, they should, national authorities should anticipate and plan for urban to rural migration um, and the market uh, migrants and countries in crisis principles, guidelines, effective practices should be used in responding to the needs of foreign nationals who are affected by pandemics. So in some, there's a lot that can be done um, and hopefully um, some of these issues will be taken into effect. And uh, I will end there. Thank you very much. Um, indeed, Susan, and yeah, we managed to get that last uh, conclusions and Thank recommendations you. slide up. Thank you very much to the team for, for pulling that one up. Thank you. Uh, for uh, our participants, our attendees. And, and really, you've highlighted, you know, very, very clearly that uh, a lot of, uh, much as in the same way as Bonson did, but a lot of kind of our, our governance framework and, and even the kind of the state-led processes such as MICIC, the Migrants in Countries in Crisis um, initiative from a few years back, I think, which came out of the 2011 uh, Libya crisis was the real impetus to get that up and running has been more sort of bespoke for small scale or smaller uh, scale and localised types of events such as Katrina, as you mentioned, and so forth. We now turn to uh, Feline, who really is looking at what it means for the big picture and the longer term and looking at more systemic and sustainable kind of shifts that come from pandemics and really making the case for utilising a range of different policy options as the norm rather than as uh, the exception. So very interested to to take to hear from Feline as you take us through your paper. It is a nice segue from um, Susan's overview in terms of the governance arrangements and some of the key issues that came up in particularly in regards to mobility restrictions and their implementation and imposition by state. So I will hand over Feline, uh, now to you, and we've already got quite a few questions coming through, so Feline, to you. Thanks. Perfect. Mary, thank you so much. It's such an honor um, to have been invited to, to contribute with, a, with this short think piece and also to be presenting here today. Thank you so much for Vicente and Susan for their presentation. You can see my presentation. Is that correct? Is that working? I don't know if I, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and it was yeah. working. I think it, you might just have sorry, to sorry. turn the screen again okay. and we'll see if we can, if we can't, if it's sort of freezing from your end, we might be able to pull it up. Um, okay. at our is it, is it, no, I, I couldn't hear, hear you for a moment there, but you can, you can hear me and you can see the presentation, correct? Yes, yes, we can. Thanks. Great. Great. So thank you for two excellent presentations. And I think with what I'm trying to, to um, walk you through today, there are actually connections to both of the previous uh, presentations, both theoretically. And I could also relate very well, Susan, to your presentation because I'm currently still involuntary, immobile in Peru because in Peru borders have been closed for the last seven months and are now um, just in the last couple of days, we opened, um, but so far only for very few uh, regional flights here within South America. So I'll be talking about the need to really rethink legal pathways to mobility. 
um, and the need to take human security seriously. And I will, I will relate or I will talk in my presentation about the problem of travel restrictions in, in the sense of the problem of travel restrictions causing new inflows of, of, of or new flows of irregular um, mobility on the one hand side and thinking a little bit about Bisson's presentation, really this tension between human security and national security and how regularization um, sits or is situated somewhat in tension uh, both with this concept of national security and the tension between national security and human security. So, as Susan um, so um, excellently presented to us, uh, COVID-19 related travel restrictions were imposed by many countries across the world and are still in place in many countries um, in the world. Uh, but we did not only see restrictive um, travel um, policies or travel restrictions, we also saw a shift towards more restrictive immigration policies more generally. And just to give you a few examples from, from around the world, South Africa, for example, debated to build a 40 kilometer fence in, in the border or on the border towards Zimbabwe as a measure to fight the virus. Um, in Chile, to give an example, one example here from South America, um, once humanitarian flights started to take off, um, there was an attempt to make returning migrants, returning humanitarian migrants, sign an affidavit that they would not return to Chile um, for uh, a time span of nine years. Um, this was then challenged by the Santiago Court of Appeals, and the policy was uh, was um, re re well was taken back. Um, in Peru, to give you one more example from from South America, we currently have five projects debated and presented by Congress, which are highly problematic, and one of them was presented within the context of the COVID-19 crisis and actually suggested the mass deportation of Venezuelan immigrants and refugees back to um, Venezuela. But we've also seen these developments, for example, in the United States um, with um, the, the temporary uh, halt on the issuing of green cards and the attempts to um, increase the requirements necessary to seek, and, seek asylum and receive refugee status uh, in the U.S. Now, something we all know as, as migration scholars and something that we've seen you know, um, across time and across different world regions is that restrictive migration policies do not dissuade people from leaving their countries. Instead, what they do is they push migrants towards irregular, irregularity. Um, and irregularity has negative impacts both for the human rights or the migrants' rights and human rights of migrants, but also for the host communities. Um, and what I'm arguing in the think piece that this is something we have known, but um, we have not really focused in this debate on the importance of this issue in the context of public health. So thus far, when we spoke about the necessity for regularization, both regular pathways to migration and regularization programs or mechanisms for irregular populations in host countries, we really focused on three, three main arguments. Um, we spoke, you know, as Vicente, uh, you do in your work uh, about the, the rights, so the, the need to protect the rights and well-being of migrants and to honor international commitments. Um, a second argument is the self-interest of states. And here I feel really this, this argument of national security still comes into the discourses or the sense-making of immigration policies in countries throughout the world. The United States and Europe, but we also very clearly see this in, in South America and sort of this tension between human rights and national security is almost treated as a given, that there is a tension. And then the third argument are the economic and social benefits, uh, again, both for uh, migrants themselves and also for um, host societies. So, so the idea that if uh, migrants are regularized and can, uh, for example, in the case of Venezuelan displaced, um, work as doctors, as engineers, they'll be able to pay taxes and thus contribute to uh, the economic development of host countries and through remittances, also the, the countries of origin. Um, and what I'm arguing in the think piece is that, uh, similar to, to, to both Susan and Vicente, that um, the COVID-19 crisis really is an opportunity to 
reframe the need for, for regularization in the context of global public health, but not only in the context of the crisis, right? Because irregularity is an obstacle for um, accessing services such as vaccines and accessing information on diseases that, go, that goes beyond the current COVID-19 crisis. And here I would like to give you one more example from South America. Um, in Venezuela, given the, the political, social, and economic crisis in Venezuela, the health system has long collapsed. There is very little reliable data. Um, but we know that commutable diseases are increasing and have been increasing in Venezuela for a long time. In the current context, the context is also COVID-19, but in past years, this has been measles, malaria, tuberculosis, and also HIV AIDS, for example. So there was a good practice in South America of a regional uh, vaccination passport. Unfortunately, already in the last two years, um, legal pathways to migration for Venezuelan migrants and refugees have become increasingly difficult to access. And thus, Venezuelans have evaded formal border crossings and could thus not take advantage of this program of a, of a regional vaccination program and of the vaccinations that were administered for free at official border crossings. Another um, important argument to, 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 to understand what right, the need for regularization or the threat, and I want to be very clear that I put this threat in inverted commas, of irregular, irregular status of migrants for public health is the situation and the vulnerability of people with both irregular and precarious legal status in their countries of destination. So um, we can think about COVID-19, but we can also think about other communicable diseases. Uh, vulnerable migrants are um, more prone to, to contracting these, these sort of diseases because they might work in unsafe conditions. They are more likely to live in, 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 in crowded um, homes. And very important, they might be and in fact, very often are afraid to contact uh, official um, ministries, institutions, and even hospitals in the case of falling ill. I can again give you one example from Peru. We know, based on a representative survey that we conducted in April, that over 70% of Venezuelans in Peru would have been afraid to, to contact um, hospitals in case of falling ill with uh, COVID-19 symptoms. So um, I think both Susan and, and Vicent, uh, we saw, you, you mentioned it in your, in your presentation, of course, there is an inter interdependence between all members of a community if we think in terms of public health. And if we have um, irregular migrants as an especially or yeah, a highly vulnerable population in this context, this affects the entire uh, host um, community. And can be, could be considered a public health risk. So not the migrant, him or herself, but his or her irregular situation. In the context of uh, COVID-19, sorry, not 10, over 20 countries, so countries across world regions have automatically extended the ability of temporary visas. Um, most countries um, in South America, for example, but also other world regions have been um, very um, flexible in relation to expiration dates. They have been innovative in implementing um, online services, uh, going online with their migration services, uh, accepting expired um, uh, documents, and so forth. Portugal, um, for example, went a step, uh, a step further and um, gave a permanent resident uh, status to all applicants with pending applications for a limited amount of time. So uh, initially, I think this went up to June or July, and a couple of days ago, this was extended to at least the end of this month. Um, in Italy, uh, the government decided to temporarily regularize uh, migrants working in certain sectors, such as the agriculture sector or, or domestic workers, in order to provide them with access to healthcare and thus protect them and the host communities in the context of the COVID pandemic. Um, some other countries uh, have taken also special measures in the, in the context of the, of the current crisis, such as incorporating foreign professionals in their national health care services, relaxing the requirements that are usually um, in place uh, in order for doctors and nurses to have their degrees convalidated. 
Now, the problem with many of these practices in the, in the context of the current crisis is that they're temporary and they're selective. Um, and I think what we need to do is to really take this opportunity, no? um, Bison, you, you, you also mentioned this, no? understanding this pandemic as an opportunity to rethink the need, the, the urging and pressing need for regularization, not only in the current context, but in, 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 in general. Um, and if we think about it in those terms, regularization becomes necessary to cover all migrants and to not be limited in time. Um, there are very few uh, positive examples thus far that go into that direction. I'm citing here one in the case of Spain, where the government has actually relaxed the requirements for migrant regularization, and particularly so regarding the extension of resident permits for um, and, and in case of, of family reunification. Um, and this brings me a little bit not to this to this paradigm shift, really, that I feel that needs to take place. Um, I think this is an opportunity, uh, or I would, I hope to believe that this is an opportunity to push narratives and to change this paradigm from this discourse that, you know, that we still see across the world on this tension between migrant regularization, yes, but, you know, this big but of national security, where very often when you actually ask officials what they, uh, what they, what they mean with national security, that is not even that clear, yeah, and maybe replace that with a clearer understanding of what we mean and and um, want to convey with human security in the sense of or in the context, specific context of global uh, public health. Um, so here, the another suggestion to reframe irregular mig migration as uh, a vulnerability uh, in terms of public health and legal pathways as a key instrument or a key weapon, if we want to use this kind of terminology, to not only fight but to prevent future pandemics. Um, and in this sense, we really have to emphasize that what is needed are not only, I mean, this is, might be a first step, short-term and sector-specific regularization programs, but we should rather really encourage states to reconceptualize the need for sustainable long-term regularization mechanisms. And I can again give you one example uh, from from Peru. Uh, in Peru, we have over half a million um, asylum applicants who will not be granted refugee status in the in the short term. The state is trying to find ways to uh, regularize, or they're not irregular, but they're in a, in a let's say precarious legal status because in 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 most cases they have not even received uh, an identity document as asylum seekers. Um, but for, for political reasons thus far, uh, we'll probably look at a regularization program, which will regularize all Venezuelans who are currently in the country. The problem is, and this again is related to COVID-19 and the longer term effect, effects that Susan also mentioned, although there has been some return to Venezuela, although flows have slowed out somewhat because of the travel restrictions and border closures, they have not ceased to exist. So we actually have seen an increase in irregular mobility across the region in the past months. And experts agree that once travel restrictions are lifted, uh, these outflows from Venezuela will continue um, and to, to, to increase once more, which will sort of leave us uh, in a similar situation in the months or, or years to come if we do not think about sustainable long-term regularization mechanisms. Um, so with this, I, I end. Uh, I thank you for your attention, and I uh, hand the microphone over to Marie again. Many thanks. Thank you so much, uh, indeed, Belen. And it went through, I think, quite beautifully in terms of a logical flow and, and some of those, you know, those innovative policy solutions that we're already seeing. Unfortunately, it's a pretty short list in some respects, and uh, and I think that's where we have to kind of work as an international community to try and extend that and, and to build on it. I have quite a few questions in the chat. I'm very conscious of time too. So what I would like to do is ask uh, three general questions and they have been um, sent through for all of the panelists. So I'll go to Vincent first and then to Susan and then to you, Feline. And then I have some specific ones that have come through for the presenters, but I will do those if we have time. So the three questions that are kind of quite sort of generic in nature that have come through relate to 
um, whether people have seen, whether any of you have seen in your research and analysis of, of uh, COVID-19 and your particular areas, whether we've seen any differences in terms of the protection of migrants during COVID from developing and developed countries. That's one that has come through. We've also had a question through on this vexed sort of issue of um, my, you know, the definition of migrants and are we really talking about um, international migrants being the carriers of COVID-19? Aren't we really talking about travellers um, who may or may not be citizens of particular countries and have various uh, statuses? And the third question for everybody is if you could really step us through briefly some of the research priorities that you think we really need to be focusing on to try and fill those knowledge gaps around COVID-19 and fully uh, understanding that we are still in the middle of it in, in many respects. But from your insights and from your initial research and analysis and reflections, what do you think are some of the really big kind of priorities for us? So, Vincent, uh, with those three sort of generic questions, I'll hand over to you first. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, I, I will be quite short uh, uh, on his interesting question, but uh, regarding the very first, at my knowledge, but of course, uh, 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 Suzanne maybe have more data about this, but at my knowledge, there is no clear-cut evidence uh, regarding the difference between uh, 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 developing and developed countries in protecting migrants during the period of COVID. My um, my recollection is that the, the, the policy adaptation of states uh, uh, has been a quite, uh, I mean, has been uh, adopted at the national level. There is a lack of coordination, clearly. Uh, I mean, this is even obvious uh, uh, when we look at uh, the EU uh, uh, during at least uh, the, four, uh, the first uh, four months. Uh, 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 during the first waves of, of the pandemic. So clearly, I, I, I think that uh, the, the answers are, uh, uh, adopted by states uh, were more uh, uh, um, ad hoc and adopted on a pure uh, uh, internal domestic uh, uh, basis. And clearly, Ah, uh, this is, uh, of course, it is easy to, to give uh, reasons, but clearly this is not the way to do because the pandemic is global by nature, and accordingly there is a need for more international cooperation uh, in order to have a, a, a common answer uh, uh, on some uh, basic uh, measures to be taken because uh, otherwise, I mean, if each single state is adopting I I its own measure, uh, it, it is going to fail because uh, the pandemic is truly global and needs a, 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 a truly global answer. So, uh, to, my, uh, 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 to my knowledge, there is no clear cut evidence on the differences between global north and global south regarding uh, the protection of migrants during COVID 19. But interestingly, there are a lot of best practices. Uh, on uh, uh, across different regions, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and probably, but clearly, the, the north-south divide here is not seems not very relevant in terms of uh, policies uh, 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 policy reactions uh, to pre uh, regarding protection of migrants. Um, uh, the second question, yes, uh, I mean. Do not migrants think that international migrants are, are, are the carriers of COVID? Probably, uh, at least the populists think so, but uh, here this is not an issue. I mean, the, 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 the spread of the contagion is, uh, uh, it, it, it is more about internal mobility than uh, transnational mobility. Right? Uh, so clearly, uh, 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 I don't think, of course, the typical answer of state and this is, we can understand this, the first reaction of state was to uh, close or at least uh, limit uh, entry of the borders. Uh, because of course, this is the first typical uh, instinct of states in case of crisis to try to close the border. 
But of course, uh, first of all, this does not work in the sense that in the unknown that this is quite easy to cross irregularly, irregularly borders, and this is counter uh, counterproductive regarding the need to uh, mitigate the spread of the contagion. And second, this is the wrong uh, uh, battle in the sense that uh, uh, the, the, the pandemic is everywhere. Not, uh, uh, this is not something from, uh, I mean, today at least, it's, it's no longer something from outside. We can, uh, uh, we can stop simply by closing borders. I mean, uh, um, we need a strong reaction, but the strong reaction is more about uh, 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 within their own territories than uh, closing uh, ex their external borders. Uh, even if this is key part of the picture, but in reality, uh, uh, the impact is quite uh, uh, trivial uh, uh, if uh, fighting against the COVID is taken seriously. And in terms of research priorities, well, I would tempt it to say that research priority is to find a vaccine to, to the COVID, first of all, because clearly uh, we, uh, this is the, the, the most urgent need for all of us. But uh, yes, there is clearly, and this is well, uh, well uh, exemplified by also the, the other speakers. Uh, I mean, there is a need to, uh, to be innovative, but of course, we should be careful because Typically, uh, uh, in times of crisis, all stakeholders are used to revisit crisis through the myopic lens of their own interest, mandate, uh, and so on. So we, uh, we, we, we must be uh, careful about that. There is a need for innovative solution, but uh, there is a need also for uh, an evidence-based approach to uh, innovative solution. The sense that it, it cannot be another opportunity to sell the typical ideas, pro uh, free, freedom of movement, we consider that this is the answer, anti migrants consider that closing border is the answer. I mean, uh, uh, the, the pandemic is too serious to simply use it an, as an excuse to uh, recycle the, the, the usual arguments. There is a need for an open minded and evidence based approach. In terms of innovations, uh, corridor, uh, uh, corridors, uh, um, um, mobility corridors, immunity passport could be interesting, uh, I think. But I mean, uh, there are many other areas to be developed further. Uh, we, we, we need to take seriously the need to adapt uh, migration policies with due regard to health consideration too. The sense that uh, uh, I mean, this is a serious issue, and we, we must uh, address these, even if, again, fighting the COVID-19, uh, 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 the answer is not only uh, to address the issue at the border, but more broadly within the territory of our states. Thank you very much indeed, Vincent. And you've um, you've really touched on a number of different sort of key issues there. I think we could probably spend quite a bit more time talking about some of those issues, especially the internal versus external border uh, restrictions that have certainly been put up very very quickly in terms of the international border restrictions, with uh, the internal coming in sort of slightly later. I will hand over now to um, Susan and then go to Feline, and then if we've got time, we'll come back to Susan because I have a couple of questions that have specifically come through for you. So Susan, on those three kind of very, I mean, they are very big and broad questions uh, posted um, by participants, but also quite interesting, I think, in terms of the particular takes. I, these are really interesting questions and hard, difficult to, to respond to. Um, in terms of any differences between uh, developing and developed countries, um, it, I can answer it a bit with regard to the travel restrictions because I we did go pretty systematically through all of the different um, ways in which countries have been addressing travel and um, as that relates to protection of uh, migrants. And I was um, actually started off thinking that there would be a big difference um, between based on the um, economic level of the countries. But um, the 
extent to which these travel restrictions can be found across the globe, no matter what level of economic development is, is really striking. And I think what happens is that a lot of it is reciprocal actions. So one country puts in um, or one region decides to go with a certain route and there's a lot of pressure to either join the bandwagon or to reciprocate with similar um, a set of policies. So um, I found a lot more consistency and I was actually, you know, I had initially thought that the, um, the U.S. policies would be amongst the most restrictive because they have been enforced in a quite restrictive way. Um, and it turned out that there were a lot of countries that are even more global in their scope in terms of the travel bans and more restrictive in their applications. So, and so it, it was a surprise to me that there was this little difference, um, although there were all of these different ways in which governments approached it. Um, and what I thought was interesting is some of the countries that had been very much affected by H1N1 or SARS um, did it did had took a different take than countries that hadn't been as affected um, by those pandemics. So I think experiences with previous um, epidemics and pandemics do have an impact. Mexico, for example, put fewer restrictions on movement because they had slapped on a lot of restrictions um, in H1N1 um, and found that it, they didn't help at all. So they were more cautious um, this time around than other countries. And I think the, um, the countries that had been particularly affected by SARS um, knew how to do it in a way that was would be more effective in, in dealing with the spread of the disease. Um, but Beyond that, I can't really, I haven't looked systematically on, at other protection issues. Um, in terms of, of what do people think about um, migrants and whether they're really thinking about travelers versus migrants and the way in which we might use the term, um, I think that, you know, clearly many members of the public do associate uh, the pandemic with person, particular nationalities. Um, I think the backlash against uh, Chinese um, when in some countries, including uh, the United States, uh, went beyond um, the travelers to not only migrants, but also citizens of Chinese descent. Um, and so, so I think some of the xenophobic reactions uh, that we've seen in various places don't make any distinction um, in between somebody who is a traveler coming in who might be spreading COVID versus somebody who's actually living in the community and is going to be affected by whatever spread there is. And I think I agree completely um, that the, the issue really is more with regard to um, whether community spread has already begun or not in a country um, in terms of the extent to which um, migrants may or may not be um, you know, people who um, are spreading and you know, we know that, uh, you know, these super events that have occurred where we've had massive of, uh, of transmission um, have occurred amongst every group that you can imagine, you know, from a president on downward um, within countries. Um, clearly, some of the travel restrictions that were more related to temporary movements um, and affected, you know, particularly the airline closures, um, which affect business travel, vacation travel, family travel, things of that sort, and not just movement for, for work or residents in another country. Um, in terms of the research priorities, I, I would um, talk about two different aspects to them. Uh, one is how we do the research, because I think we've discovered that a pandemic affects tremendously how one actually um, does research on this, these issues. Um, the first thing is I think that we need many more collaborative research um, efforts between public health experts and migration experts. Um, I think the research has tended to be in silos. Um, I've read a lot of the public health research now. Um, gone through it, it's very, very good, but many parts of it were totally un 
not understandable to somebody who um, is not in the public health um, field. Um, and many of the um, many of the articles don't really understand migration systems and how they work and what is what are the drivers of migration um, and how they um, intersect. So I think that if we had more collaborations, we get a whole lot further in understanding both the role of movements in the spread of the disease and the impact of the disease on on migration issues. So I, I would certainly argue for that. And then I think clearly we need new research methods um, because the kind of surveys that many of us do um, just you know are really difficult to, to uh, put into effect given the travel restrictions and the pandemic itself and the um, threat um, for that. Um, I think we need to um, be really looking much more um, more extensively at the use of the what you know, we tend to call big data. Um, social media, for example, as a, as a way of getting information about how pandemics are perceived, how they are, they spread, what the um, the uh, migration responses mean um, on that. Also, cell phone data, mobile data um, can be a, a very powerful way of looking at mobility patterns when you can't do interviews uh, with people. There are privacy and security concerns with the use of those types of data, and I think we need more attention to how they can be used and um, and analyzed um, more effectively um, in that area. Um, and then the, um, I think we, in terms of topics we need, um, we need to know more about the internal movements because um, as in almost every other form of migration, there are an awfully lot more people moving or being in forcibly immobile as in, in within countries than there are those who cross borders. Um, so we need to know more about what's happening within countries and these issues, um, but also how what is happening within countries may be affecting cross border movements. Um, a second is that we do need to know more about return, um, whether it's return within within countries from the um, urban to rural areas. Uh, but there have been a few notable ex um, examples of massive um, cross-border return um, of people who were seeking to get home before um, before they, the borders closed and they wouldn't be able to do so. We need to know much more about what happened there. Um, and the third area is that I think that we need to um, be up, you know, really upping the search on the impact of the pandemics on migrants who you know, are, are already in uh, countries of destination or who were in countries of transit um, at the time the pandemic hit. Uh, to find out more about what's happened to them and what their experiences are, what their needs are, um, and what we can learn from those situations. So th those are just a few areas where I think uh, better research priorities. Great. Thank you very much, Susan. There's a lot uh, to think about there, and certainly um, I'm sure that that was just your short list um, yeah. rather than <laughs> the long list, exactly. Um, I will now, I'm very conscious of time too, and Feline, if it's okay, would we be able to turn to you uh, now? We're kind of up in terms of time, but if that's okay with everybody in terms of the panelists and attendees, I would like to give you a few minutes to, to offer your insights, Philine, in terms of those uh, three questions. I don't think we're going to be able to get to the specific questions, but um, at least, Philine, I would like to hand over to you if that's possible. Thank you. I'll try to be very brief. So in terms of the North-South divide or, or developers, developing countries divide, my impression would be, and I have not looked at this systematically, that there were more complete lockdowns in the global South than in the global North. So in Peru, for example, there was a complete lockdown for three months. Um, and I, I would say that that affected migrants specifically because these are countries where migrants are already in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an especially vulnerable situation. Uh, we had a complete lockdown. Uh, police and, and, and the military were, were, were guarding that lockdown, uh, and migrants were not included in any kind of bonuses paid by the state to, uh, you know, on behalf of the Peruvian population uh, to be able to survive that lockdown, right? So we had a lot of situations ranging, ranging from evictions to simply, uh, uh, simply Venezuelans 
coming outside, trying to work, trying to bake in order to survive. And I think those very dramatic situations probably were different, and I would relate them to my impression of seeing more lockdowns, complete lockdowns in, in the global south. Um, travelers versus migrants, uh, I would agree that the, the, the virus mostly spread through global travelers, but once again, migrants and more vulnerable, irregular or just um, maybe as migrants in, in, a, in a low socioeconomic condition, so not the ones that are, uh, you know, uh, flying around the globe, as many of us very often do, were the ones most affected by the restrictions that followed. Um, and I would like to re-emphasize this point that if we have travel restrictions uh, and border closures, that leads to more irregular uh, migration, more vulnerability, less access to social services, higher risks in terms of public health for everyone. So it's all related. What do we need? We need research on legal status um, and the effect of legal status for the inclusion of migrants, and not only in economic terms, because we usually focus on incorporation in the formal labor market. We need to look more at the global south, where we have economies such as Peru, where over 70% of the economy is informal. So the issue maybe isn't that much the inclusion in the formal uh, labor market, but inclusion in terms of services and, uh, and the, the safeguarding of, of other human rights, such as health and education. Uh, and also, from a Global South perspective, research on um, COVID-19 trust xenophobia. Yeah, those issues um, are unfortunately taking – it was already an issue before COVID. Unfortunately, we see very concerning developments in, in that regard, and we need to understand these issues better, uh, especially in countries where there is no welfare system uh, and where there, there perhaps is a more uh, severely felt competition for limited uh, services, public services. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, indeed. And you touched on the, the issues around, you know, the social protection uh, kind of mechanism. We have really focused um, today in terms of the specific aspects in regards to human rights and regular pathways and mobility and immobility regimes, but they do interconnect with broader socioeconomic uh, policy frameworks as well as the socioeconomic uh, policy responses and the recovery kind of plan uh, going forward. That's really, there's a couple of specific questions that have come through uh, for particular speakers. Susan, if you can, Stay on the line. I know it's early, actually, your time, yeah. so you shouldn't I'm be fine. picking. But in terms of, and it's very early days when we're talking about changing trends and changing patterns of mobility, but um, we have one question in regards to what you think might be some of the projections around the urban to rural shift and what might be some of the factors related to people either staying in rural uh, communities or seeking to go back to cities or go even further afield uh, to other countries. So some of the, we, I, I know it's very difficult to talk about numbers, but some of the key aspects in terms of migrant decision making, I think would be um, particularly useful. And then I also have a question for Feline really in regards to um, regularization. And the question is, it's a really difficult one, I know, but, but how could we seek to influence some of the policy discussions to promote the benefits of regularization? And I think your paper kind of clearly outlines, you know, the case for more sustainable and systemic regularization programs rather than just these very short-term um, temporary kind of mechanisms. But if you can provide any insights in terms of some of the policy dialogues and some of the discussions or other innovative tools that might be able to be utilized, uh, that would be great. So first over to you, Susan, thanks. Sure. Thank you. Well, as you said, the uh, numbers really aren't in in any systematic way. Um, these are, a lot of it is, is anecdotal. Um, I think we'll see two different trends. Uh, think at the lower end of the labor market, um, where people went back in mass, like the India um, photo that I showed, um, I think that will be more or less temporary, um, a temporary return as the economy begins to improve. The same drivers that led to the 
rural to urban migration will kick in again and a lot of people, not everyone, but a lot of people will return to where they have been working and either the same employers are looking for, for new work um, on that. I think that the higher end of the labor market, um, this may be a more permanent shift um, and that's because of the, you know, relative success of the remote work environment um, for many high high skilled um, professionals and others who have been able to work from home. And I think that for them, there may be a different form of mobility where um, rather than clustering um, around where their work site is, I think we may see a more dis dispersed work market um, and people living in uh, places that wouldn't normally be seen as um, you know, hotbeds of, of, of economic life. Um, I don't think it's going to be you know, the, the pattern that we see, but I suspect that there will be um, increasing movements towards this, um, this pattern um, and uh, companies finding that the physical properties that they have are too expensive to maintain um, in light of what they can be doing in a more remote way on that. Um, and I think that will affect both internal and international migration. Um, so I think we're going to see different patterns um, coming, and uh, but I don't see that the urban to rural movements are going to be sustainable for the most part, um, and, you know, except in very specific situations. Great. Thank you very much. Belinda, over to you. Thanks. So the argument would be you know, that irregular migration or keeping people in an irregular status is a public health risk. Now, when we have to be careful because uh, the risk there is to say irregular migrants are a threat. And I think we have to be very careful to say not the irregular migrants are the threat, but their irregular status. And we have, and this, this argument has to be uh, presented with, with the, with the, with the sec in the second step saying irregular migration cannot be prevented. We know that. So um, that is not an option. Even if we wanted to, even if we close borders, uh, people will cross, there will be mobility, there will be irregular mobility and uh, migration if we do not offer legal pathways. So the only option we really have if we're interested in uh, human security for all and human security of our own communities and our own voters is to regularize migrants and to, to, to let them move in regular pathways in the first place to regularize them in case they've fallen into irregular status uh, in the host communities in order to be able to include them in public health policies. And in the context of pandemics, we have to include everyone, otherwise we will not be successful. Um, that would be the argument. Um, it's a little bit tricky. I myself, I'm not sure what to do about that, that trap no? of falling into or being misread as saying irregular migrants are the problem, right? Um, so it has to be always presented jointly with the argument that irregular migration is not preventable and that we thus have to um, offer regular pathways to migration and to regularization. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. And that's an age-old issue, really, isn't it, um, for a lot of uh, migration researchers um, in terms of yeah, the utilisation of the evidence, as Vincent sort of pointed out, to inform uh, policies often goes to value systems within particular countries or cities or local authorities, uh, so on and so forth. Now, we are way over time, but I, we still have quite a few people online. So what I would like to do in terms of, of closing is really uh, give each of the panellists sort of one minute just in case there are pressing things at the top of their minds that they didn't get a chance to say or to present or to offer um, our um, participants, do a round table and then we'll finally close if that's okay. So, Vonson, I will hand over uh, to you. Thanks. I think you're muted still, Vonson. Thank you very much for, uh, for this very interesting uh, discussion. So I, I will be short and will simply repeat the need for an evidence-based uh, 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 policies. 
the risk is that uh, the old uh, answer will be used, uh, 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 and the, there is no, I mean, uh, the risk is too important to continue uh, recycling the old uh, habits, the old uh, 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 answers. There is the need to think openly uh, uh, this uh, uh, issue and establish uh, without partisan clans, uh, uh, political bias. The, the need for a truly collective answer. This pandemic is truly global, and it is a question of, uh, uh, is, uh, now there is a need for common good, for common policy, based on solidarity, cooperation, and evidence-based data. I will stop now. <laughs> Fantastic. Sounds like you're quoting from the Global Compact, actually. But <laughs> we haven't really mentioned that that much, actually, today. But it, you know, it does set up, set up the framework, um, as, as you have certainly made the case for in previous papers and, and previous um, webinars and discussions. Susan, a final minute um, from sure. you. If you are able to share your last insights, uh, pressing yes. point. Yeah, well, I'm actually going to use my minute to. Thank you uh, for organizing this uh, webinar and your staff, um, and also to IOM for having um, both produced and collated so much information on COVID-19 and its impact on migration. I think in, in light of uh, Vincent's comments, which I agree with completely, um, I think that the um, getting the research community together to talk about these issues and figure out what are the research um, issues. Simon has made a tremendous contribution. Um, I wish I could say that this is going to be the last time we have to deal with these issues. Uh, you refer to this as the big one. It's actually reading the public health literature. It's not the big one. Um, the expectation is for not only more to come, but even more um, disruptive pandemics um, ahead of us. So it's really important that we figure out how to do this right um, in protecting the public health, but also protecting the rights of migrants um, and identifying their needs and addressing them. So thank you again. Thank you very much, Susan. And yes, I completely agree. What I meant by the big one was in the last 100 years. And there's certainly, it's very clear that um, the interaction between uh, you know, urban settlements and human um, kind of encroachment on environment is a, is a key issue in terms of the zoonotic coronaviruses. It's a it's a it's a key key lesson for all. But it, that lesson has been around for quite some time, and unfortunately, um, uh, some powers that be haven't really taken that on board. I will hand over now to uh, Feline, and then we can wrap it up. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you again to Vincent, to Susan, Marie. Um, Maybe the, the key word you mentioned at the end, lessons. No, maybe we, we have to try to really look for those good practices, uh, throw more light onto um, positive examples, maybe have a look at, at, at some of the countries that now have, have regularized migrants and kind of compare their experiences with countries that have done the opposite. Uh, so always presenting, not only criticizing as academics and as civil society, but you know presenting governments with, with pos positive examples that hopefully have more positive outcomes, um, and in the in the in the conversation with governments, we need to focus on rights absolutely, but we also have to pack, repackage and kind of uh, present this in the in the in the sense of self interest of states uh, and include really include um, public health in, in 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 that sense. Thank you. Thank you so much um, indeed, and thank you to our fantastic panellists and for staying online as well. We are 15 minutes over time, but honestly, we could have kept going because it's such a, a rich and interesting discussion with some really pressing issues. Um, and Susan has mentioned we've been doing a lot of work on this and lots of different parts of IOM, and, and it won't be the end. We will be obviously coming back to um, key thought leaders and experts to share their insights um, well into the future. So we thank you very, very much for your collaboration, for your time, and especially uh, for your papers, um, because they are being widely accessed and widely read. So thank you very much. I would also just finally like to thank the team, especially Josiane, 
and Celine and Adrian for helping with the WebEx uh, technicalities and putting together all of the support mechanisms. As we're going, we're learning and it's going a little bit more smoothly every time. Uh, so thank you very much for that. And also to the people who have participated, we have had a very large number of questions. Uh, we haven't been able to get to them, but that's another lesson for us. We might make the webinars a little bit longer so that we can have part of the Q&A um, extended because there is obviously such an appetite for the discussion and for, for some thoughts in terms of some of the key issues in regards to COVID-19 and migration and mobility. So thank you again. We shall sign off. Thanks again to everybody and uh, we will look forward to the next webinar. Thanks. Bye.